Matthew chapter 6 verses 1 to 13 Beware of practicing your piety before men in order to be seen by them for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven but thus when you give alms sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by men truly I say to you they have their reward but when you give alms do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be in secret and your father who is who sees in secret will reward you and when you pray you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by men truly I say to you they have their reward but when you pray go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you and in praying do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do for they think they will be heard for their many words do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him pray then like this our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil we now come to the spiritual behavior of the Christian and there is a complete change which we have not always found easy to learn our purity our moral standards must be put on a lampstand for everybody to see we must nail our colors to the mast here we must let everybody know where we stand on these issues chastity fidelity charity the lot we must let them see but our religious side we must not let them see keep it quiet in a word the secret of true religion is religion in secret the background again the scribes and the Pharisees I'm afraid and the three examples are the three pillars of Jewish piety giving praying and fasting and our Lord assumed that his followers would follow these three pillars and that Christians would fast as well as pray and give strange that fasting has become a kind of optional extra for those ascetic saints who care to do it but it's as much part of the Christian life as praying and as giving Christ didn't say if you pray if you give if you fast he said when you do this is how you do it and I commend that to you now the first thing is the need for secrecy the Pharisees took steps to make it public when they gave they literally blew a trumpet before them literally now you may think well I could never do that well mind you sometimes the way we talk you'd think our trumpeter had died but they did it literally now they rationalized it they rationalized it by saying this will encourage others to give now I share this with you not because I want to be critical of a brother but one of my earliest memories as a small boy was going to a missionary meeting where the chairman at the time of the offering took out his checkbook told us the amount he was writing on it and put it in the plate and said there I want that to encourage you to do your best do you know that left an abiding, abiding impression on my little mind but not of the right sort we can do it we can publish subscription lists we can do it openly they did it in their way we can do it in ours they chose to be right at the street corner when the clock struck nine and twelve and three in the afternoon now as the man sitting behind me here a friend who was with me out in Aden and he will remember perhaps the man in 
Shekhov's men, the Arab, the men who play, prayed at street corners. He was called that by the other Arabs. And he still did this. Out there on the street corner at Sheikh men, which is now in the news, as you know, he used to stand on the corner at the hours. He was known, the man who prayed at street corners. It's still done. It's still done by us, too, in different, more refined ways. Fasting, they disfigured their faces. They used plenty of eyeshadow, And they went out and looked dreadful. People said, uh, are you ill? Are you feeling well? And, oh, no, I'm fasting. You see, it's Lent. I'm doing without sweets. And uh, so it was... Uh, Paraded. Now, Jesus said, take positive steps to keep it quiet. Not just, uh, not positive steps to make it public. Take positive steps to keep it quiet. When you give, don't even let yourself know what you're giving. And if you don't think of your gift, you're not likely to display it to others. Can you forget the gifts you give? That's a happy memory. It was said of one great saint that he always forgot a good turn he did, but he never forgot a good turn he received. That's a lovely memory to have. Don't even let yourself know. When you pray, deliberately get away from others, if it's at all possible. Edward Wilson used to climb into the crow's nest of the Terra Nova in the Antarctic expedition and got right away from them. Fasting, while well, you put your best clothes on and look fit and healthy. Now, dare we apply this to ourselves? I'm going to be very direct here and raise questions which could cause furious discussion. And uh, you've got discussion groups, but I hope by the time you get into them you'll have forgotten this. But may I really be direct on this? I do not believe it is good advice to tell a Christian who's going into the forces to kneel down by their bunk the first night. I don't think that is what our Lord meant us to shine in public. I really don't. Frankly, if a man's a real Christian, the others in the barrack room will find out quickly enough from his moral standards. They don't need to see that. And the problem of mixed motives that comes when you pray before others is a real problem. I heard of a conference, a residential conference of bishops, and they all found themselves in one dormitory. And the boldest of them was the man who got up first from his knees after <laughs> the, the quiet time. Now, I opened a church recently, or spoke at the opening of a church recently, and the end wall, which was on the main street, with many people passing by, was a sheer sheet of plain glass. And I noticed the whole service, people were curiously looking in. And I wondered if that was really in, in the spirit of this. I have worn a dog collar. I did for ten years. I was a Methodist minister, and I did. But I began to wonder, am... I, in their minds, parading my piety. I began to wonder if that wasn't one of the reasons why men changed their conversation mm -hmm. when they saw a dog collar. Should we really wear a badge that tells others we read the Bible? Now, I'm throwing out questions to try and show that we've got to look at ourselves and not just laugh at these people who blew their trumpets. The one part of our life that ought to be kept strictly secret is our devotional behavior. Our quiet time should be kept quiet. Now that's being very direct, but Jesus said the mixed motives that come in when anybody else knows about this and you know they know are a real hindrance. He says you will get your reward and the wording he uses means that's all you will get. They have their reward of men and that's all they do have. They've got a reputation for being spiritual, but that's all they get. But he said, your father is the only one who needs to see your piety. And it's only possible to be free from hypocrisy and full of sincerity if we take positive steps towards secrecy. And the need for secrecy is really the need for sincerity. With the best will in the world, if we do a thinking thing in front of other people, we are tempted to be aware of their reaction to what we do. Now let your light shine, let your moral standards shine, put your purity on a pedestal for all to see, that they may glorify your Father, but your religion, your piety, is between yourself and God alone. The implications of this for Christian witness are far-reaching, and we need to remember them, and we need to ask at every point whether we ever parade our piety in even the most subtle form. 
And so I come at last to the Lord's Prayer. Our Lord <coughs> interrupted here to give us a prayer which is to be the model of our prayer when we pray in private. Again, I think we are letteralists when we use the Lord's Prayer on so many occasions and we, we repeat it. I always thought that chart was the next word in the second phrase of the Lord's Prayer. We said it so often as children, Our Father, chart in heaven. I know somebody else who thought God's name was Harold and for years said, Harold be thy name, just because we repeat the words ad infinitum. How often do we really understand or think of what we say when we say the Lord's Prayer? It's not to be a rote, it's to be a model. And I think if we went through the Lord's Prayer now, before we pray, it might even stop us praying, but at least it would be helpful to make us pause and think. How should we pray when we've got right alone by ourselves, when we're quiet, when we're not in front of others, just to God, how should we pray? Well, Jesus practiced and preached prayer, but he never used the Lord's Prayer himself. It wouldn't have been appropriate. Forgive us our trespasses. It's a prayer he didn't need to pray himself, but it's a prayer we need to. And he makes the point, it's not whether we pray, but what we pray that matters. Not whether we pray, but what we pray. Or to put it differently, it's not the quantity, but the quality of prayer. It's not the length, but the depth. And the Greek word for much speaking is batologio, which in Latin is blattero, which in English is blether. And the one thing that we are not to do in prayer is to blether. I presume you know that uh, term. I remember being in a prayer meeting when uh, a brother prayed for, oh, endless. We went all around the, the world and back again and prayed for everybody conceivable. And when he'd finished, somebody said, Amen, brother. And I couldn't make out whether it was brother <laughs> or blather. <laughs> but I, I think I agreed with the latter after that prayer. Now, we do need form in prayer. Can I put it in a cliché, my own, but not a very good one? Without fervor, form becomes formality. But without form, fervor becomes fever. And therefore, it is a balance of form and fervor which is to be the object of our prayer. And for one, I'm certainly not against liturgical prayers. We use them in our church. We use responsive prayers every Sunday morning, which surprises some because it's a Baptist church. But we do. We use form and we use fervor. I noticed that in Acts 2, they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, the Breaking of Bread, and the Prayers badly translated as prayer, the prayers. That means the set prayers, the forms of prayer. But they fill them with fervor. Now here is a form which can be a formality or filled with fervor, it becomes real prayer. Notice about this prayer, it is brief. One of the first qualities in prayer. It is brief and I've been very encouraged by the length or lack of length of the prayers here at this conference. I think it's been very commendable. We've all joined in because they've been brief. Notice that it's simple. A child can begin to use this prayer, but notice that it's profound. You'll still not understand it at the end of your Christian life. Notice that it's comprehensive. It covers everything. Notice that it's universal. It can be translated into any language and used. Notice that it's a challenging prayer. Robert Louis Stevenson jumped up from the breakfast table once and ran out in the middle of family devotions and his wife went out after him and said what's the matter he said I can't pray the Lord's Prayer today I'm not ready I wish we could be like that when we repeat the Lord's Prayer now let's look at it the person to whom we pray Father it's a family prayer occasionally in scripture he's said to be the father of every creature as the begetter of every creature more often he's called a father of the Jews, still more often he's the father of Jesus Christ and by adoption our father. When a little baby in a Jewish family is taught to speak, they are taught to say Abba. It's our equivalent of Dada. And when we shout out, says Paul, not when we think, when we cry out involuntarily, Abba, Dad. It is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are his children to cry out Abba. I was once in a prayer meeting in the Shetland Islands where I began my ministry about 17 years ago 
And a dear old fisherman got up in the church prayer meeting and he just said, Abba, Abba. That's all he said. What a prayer. Father, to think that the eternal God who set the stars in their courses and made everything that is, is my dad. They said to Jesus once, would you teach us to pray? They didn't say, would you teach us how to pray? They'd been taught how to pray by their parents. They were good Jews. They said, would you teach us to pray like that? He said, yes, when you pray, say, Dad, Abba. But lest that intimacy be abused, it is our Father in heaven that will introduce respect into the intimacy. And it is also our Father that balances the individual and the corporate. Do you notice that even when you are alone, you should say our? That will alter your petitions pretty quickly. That will affect your prayer. If you regard yourself as one of a group when you're alone in your room and you say, Our Father, we need this. When you went into your room privately yesterday, did, did you pray my or our? What a wonderful thing when we separate to go into our rooms for private devotions and we get down on our knees by ourselves and then bring the whole conference with us and say, Lord, we need this. Our need is this. Our Father, give us in this conference, even when you're alone. That's the way to pray. And it corrects those selfish prayers that are too my and too me. Now we notice the six petitions in beautiful balance, three each, Three for the needs of God, three for the needs of ourselves. Thy, 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 ah, ah, ah. And you notice the order? The unbeliever comes with his shopping list to God. Me, 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 my, my, my. The believer comes, thy, thy, thy. His first concern in prayer is what God wants from us, not what we want from God. And you notice a beautiful pattern here. In the first three, we have Father, Son, and Spirit. Thy name, thy kingdom, you can't think of that without the king. And the kingdom will come when the king comes. And thy will, do you know that in an early version of the Lord's Prayer, in an early manuscript, instead of saying, thy will be done, the phrase is, thy spirit be given. Because who can do God's will without the spirit being given? So you have Father, Son, and Spirit. And then you have Father, Son, and Spirit again. Daily bread is the Father's responsibility and gift. Forgiveness is that which is obtained by the Son through his blood. And lead us not into temptation. It was the Spirit who led the Lord into temptation in the wilderness. And it's the Spirit we're concerned with to lead us out of it. Let me just look at each of these phrases a little more deeply. The name of God, as we heard last night, is the revelation of his nature. What God is. Now you see, a name doesn't mean anything until you know the person. I don't know you, most of you I didn't know before I came here. You may have seen my name somewhere. You may have wondered what sort of a, a creature that name signified. Now you have some sort of idea, varied ideas, different reactions. But the name means more because you've just got to fill it out a bit with personal knowledge. If you're going to reverence God's name, if it's ever going to be held in awe, then people have got to know what he's like. And that name, the name God, the name Father, the name Lord. You won't take it in vain if you know who it refers to. A man who is in our church who works in a factory said to me the other day that he was in the factory and, and someone was taking the name of Jesus in a blasphemous way. And this Christian just turned round to him and said, Would you mind not talking like that? You're talking about someone I love. It was a lovely way to deal with it wasn't so much a reprimand as a request. That's reverencing the name. Oh, may, may thy name be hallowed. May people, whenever they hear the name God, pause and stand and think. Perjury, profanity, flippancy, incredulity, hypocrisy, familiarity, blasphemy. There are dozens of ways in which God's name is not hallowed. The second thing, his kingdom may come now scholars have argued as to what this means but frankly it means two things to me you can tell a man's theology by asking him what the word kingdom means you can tell if he's a Jehovah's Witness too but the word kingdom is crucial to the, your theology and as far as I can see it humbly in scripture it means two things it means a present slow process 
and a future sudden crisis. And the parables include both. And the kingdom comes as an individual enters into the reign of God by faith and repentance. And the kingdom comes when the king suddenly returns in his glory to establish peace and righteousness. When I pray thy kingdom come, I think of both. A present process and a future crisis. When I pray thy will be done, it is not resentment. It is not resignation. It is resolution. There are two words for the word will in scripture. They shade into each other in meaning, but they are distinct in their central meaning. And one means decree and the other means desire. And the word used here is desire, not decree. He wills that all should be saved means he desires that all should be saved, not he decrees. And here it is not thy decree be done, that's fatalism, that's resignation. It is thy desire be done, it's resolution. The emphasis is on the word done, thy will be done. Let's go out and do it. That's the prayer. Give us this day our daily bread now. <laughs> Better be careful here again, hadn't I? The Roman Catholics interpret that of the sacraments. And the Douay version translates this phrase, give us this day our super substantial bread. Spot the deliberate mistake, it sticks out like a sore thumb. But neither is the daily bread the scriptures. And evangelicals go to the other end of the scale. It means daily bread. And the word translated daily really means, as we now know, William Barclay has revealed this in his research, it means for the next 24 hours. So it's really, give us this day our bread for tomorrow. We are to live just a day at a time like that and acknowledge that our physical sustenance is a gift. Forgive us our debts. The Scots say this, I think, don't they? And we now sing it using the uh, modern tune to the Lord's Prayer. It isn't really the things we've done, it's the things we've left undone that we need to pray about here. Forgive us what we owe to you. Even when we've done our best, we're unprofitable servants. We're still poor in spirit. We're still in debt. Lord, forgive us our debts. And the condition, not the basis of that forgiveness, but the condition is that we are prepared to pass on God's mercy towards what has not been done. And finally, lead us not into temptation. That does not mean, and I would disagree here with the New English Bible, it does not mean test. It does mean tempt. And God does lead people into temptation. He doesn't tempt them, but he does lead into temptation. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. God is in control of how much we are exposed to the devil. And if we trust him, he will not let us be tempted above what we can bear. He will control our exposure to the devil. But sometimes as a discipline, he exposes us to the devil that we might learn the hard way that we are not trusting him. And this is a request to God not to expose us too much to the devil that we might learn the easier, not the hard way to let the Holy Spirit garrison our hearts. But deliver us from the evil one. I wish we could get back to what Jesus said. He didn't say evil, he said the evil, which means the evil one. You start the Lord's Prayer with God, you finish with Satan. That's a right order of prayer. You come into God, you go out to Satan. And you need to ask him to deliver you from Satan when you go out into the world again, out of your closet. To say thine is the kingdom is an act of faith. To say thine is the power is an act of hope. And to say thine is the glory is an expression of love. To say mine is the kingdom, the power and the glory is to fall into the very error of pride into which Nebuchadnezzar fell when he said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power for my majesty and glory? To say mine is to be proud, but to say thine is to be humble forever and ever. And then the ringing certainty of your prayer, Amen, so shall it be. It's the same word as verily, truly. Amen, amen, truly, truly. Well, that's how we're to pray. To pray for what God wants from us first, and then to pray for what we need from him.